It's one o'clock, time to begin. We're very excited to have this uh, special session for you today on the founding of the Mises Institute. Um, we have an informal panel discussion set up. Uh, the panelists include some of the faculty that you've met already this week, myself, along with Professor Salerno and Professor Gordon. All of us were involved uh, with the Mises Institute from, uh, from its earliest years. We also have a special guest, Ms. Pat Barnett. Pat is, has been... <laughs> Pat was one of the Mises Institute's first employees. Uh, she has served in a variety of roles at the Institute, uh, recently retired as the Executive Vice President of the Mises Institute, but she still serves on the Institute's board and performs a number of consulting roles. And then the gentleman in the middle, I'm sure needs no introduction whatsoever, the founder of the Mises Institute, Mr. Lou Rockwell. <laughs> I was asked to moderate this discussion, given, given that I'm the most moderate person among the faculty. <laughs> and the youngest. <laughs> and, yeah, and the youngest, just barely, that's true. Um, so I'm gonna pose some questions to the panelists and uh, allow them to sort of freestyle their responses, and then we'll have some time at the end for you guys to ask some questions. Um, let me start, uh, of course, with Lou. And uh, Lou, you have uh, written and spoken about the founding of the Institute many times, and some of the students may have watched those videos or read some of those articles. Um, so they probably know how you were involved with uh, uh, the conservative intellectual movement uh, in the 1960s and 70s, how you met uh, Ludwig von Mises when you were an editor for Arlington House, which was translating and publishing some of Mises' works in English, and how you went on to found the Mises Institute in 1982. Now, Murray Rothbard was one of your co-conspirators in the early days, and Murray served as the uh, academic vice president or the chief academic officer of the Mises Institute from the beginning. So could you maybe start by telling us how you met Murray Rothbard and what role Murray played in sort of shaping your vision of the Institute? I first met Murray Rothbard in uh, the, the 1970s when he was writing books for Arlington House publishers. Arlington House was the company founded by Neil McCaffrey, the great scholar entrepreneur. Um, so a great man. In fact, I'll never forget the day that he invited me into, into his office and he, and he said, how'd you like to be Ludwig von Ludv 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 Mises' editor? I thought, well, holy smokes, I thought that'd be tremendous. So the three, three, three of his books were out of print, which was a terrible thing. We want to bring them back into print. And also, he's got a monograph on the history of the that he's written on the history of the Austrian school that he wants that we want to publish, and he wants you to, to handle all that. And I said, "Well, I'd be delighted, of course." So I I, uh, I did it, and uh, I read those three books, and I was aware of Mises before that, and of course, I knew he was a great man, and I'd read some of his smaller works, but this is when I really began to study him, and and uh, you know the great. Um, um, Linda, Linda Reed, who was the founder and the president of the Foundation for Economic Education, which in those days was entirely an, Aust an Austrian organiza or organization, he held a celebration of the publication of these three books. And at that, at that event, I was able to have dinner with Margaret and Louis well, Mises. I'd only dealt with them on the phone before this. And Mises, I must say this was a, a life-changing experience, experience for me. Murray Rothbard later wrote about Mises. He said he was a representative of an older and a better civilization, and he sure was. And just the way he dressed, his manners, his manner of speaking, his table manners, I mean, everything about him, you know, just, just astounding and uh, made a permanent imp impression on me. And also his wife, Margaret von Mises, who I later didn't have much, much to do with when I started the Institute. So uh, I went on to have several other jobs. But about 10 years later, I was concerned that it seemed to me that Mises' writings, his, 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 his person, were becoming less and less interesting to, be, interesting to people. He was getting less and less attention. 
the academic world and just in the general public. And I thought this is not a good thing. And I, this, this time I was working as the associate director of the Law and Economic Center at Emory University, which was a, a uh, free market, but unfortunately classical, uh, um, not non-Austrian organization. And although Henry Manny was the, was the director, liked Mises and had sympathies with Mises, an unusual among those, among those people. But uh, one day I was, I was looking around the, the room and it was, it was a smaller organization than the Mises Institute is now today, but it was still a, a, a big organization to, to me. And I looked around it and I thought, I could do this. <laughs> so I, so I uh, applied for a 501c3 status, which in those days happened quite quickly. And uh, got that and then I incorporated it in, uh, in, the, in the District of Columbia. And it's funny, but uh, this seems counterintuitive, but DC is actually a great place to have your organization uh, registered in, and uh, they pay far less, much, much less attention to you than if you were to be un unlikely enough to be re registered in California or New York or in, in most, of, most of the other states. So uh, I set up the institute there and, and uh, after about a year, we, I thought we needed to be affiliated with the university, probably wrongly, but it ended up us, uh, us moving to Auburn, which I think was a good thing. And uh, it, uh, one, of the, one of the first, after I started the institute, the first thing I did after meeting with Margaret von Mises and asking her to become our first, our first chairman, and she, uh, she said, I know you just want my name, and she says, you can have my name, but you don't want my and, and input otherwise. I said, of course I do, because I knew she'd been, as Ms. Murray a little bit later called her, a one-woman Mises industry, keeping his books in print and just promoting his, 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 him all over, the, all, all over the world. And she was a, a brilliant lady, a great lady, and uh, so I got to work with her for about 10 years before her death, and uh, that, that was a great experience. But uh, the, first, the first person that I talked to right after I had, I took Margaret to her favorite, favorite restaurant in New York, which was the Russian Tea Room. And then I, I, I made an appointment with Murray Rothbard, and I said, Murray, would you become our academic, academic vice president and really our, our inspiration? So he, the only time I've ever seen anybody do this, he actually jumped a little bit in the air and clapped his hands. <laughs> <laughs> he, he, was, he was so happy. So that, uh, so until his death, he was, you can't imagine what a blessing it was to be able to talk to Murray every day and to, uh, he loved, his, he loved what, what he calls sociology, which was gossip. <laughs> Of the libertarian movement, so just and also Murray was he was like a comedian. He was like you weren't you weren't around him for more than a minute before you're laughing out loud. Just, just so funny, so interesting, so brilliant. I remember once being at a academic a used academic bookstore in New York City with him and a couple of other people, and people started sort of teasing him. As, see which books he'd read and which, what, what, what he was familiar with. It seemed like he was familiar with every single book in the bookstore. I'm sure that's not actually true, but pr probably pretty much true. I mean, in the, in the areas that he was interested in. He just, uh, what a great genius. And unlike Milton Friedman, not at all arrogant. Unusual for somebody that brilliant and that important. Entirely non-arrogant and uh, happy to talk to anybody. Um, always looking for smart students to, uh, to, do their, to do their dissertations on important subjects. And he just, I, I must say I miss him every day still today. He just, the most, the most extraordinary inspiration for all of us at the incident when he was here and, and uh, even since his passing. I think of Murray looking down on us and, and uh, saying, attaboy, Lou, and attaboy, all you guys. It's just... Uh, uh, you, you must be very, very pleased at what's happened to the Institute and to, 
And what we're doing, because of course what we're doing is even more necessary today than it's ever been in uh, what's becoming a, 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 almost a uh, Marxist country, almost, almost a communist country. It's just unbelievable, but we're here to hold the flag of, li of liberty. And uh, because one of our most important programs is this one. As, as Joe mentioned the other day, this is our 39th, and uh, had more than 4,000 students graduate from this. And they've had a, a tremendous effect on the profession and, uh, and other, other, other uh, businesses that they've, they've gone into. So we look for that, for that sort of thing from all of you, too. We look for great successes. And uh, I must say this has been the greatest thing of my life, to be able to be involved with the Institute all these years. Just magnificent, and uh, we've got great plans ahead to be, be better and more successful, more influential, and uh, just keep an eye on us. So, uh, Lou, to many of us, it seems like an institute founded and operated by a visionary entrepreneur like yourself, uh, with, with a creative genius like Murray Rothbard uh, also at the helm. That sounds like a no-brainer. I mean, who wouldn't want an organization like that to succeed. I remember myself when I was an undergraduate student considering going to graduate school, and I happened, I had already discovered the ideas of Mises and Rothbard independently, but I saw a piece of paper on the wall. This was the pre-internet era, and it was just a, you know, a, a, a flyer that said, Mises Institute, you know, apply here for scholarships. I mean, I was completely floored. I don't think I did the Murray dance clap thing, but <laughs> I, I, I was shocked to find out that someone had founded an institute and named it for Ludwig von Mises, who I thought had maybe been completely forgotten. At the same time, we know that when you were getting the institute started, there were other individuals and organizations within the libertarian movement more broadly who were not totally enthusiastic about you starting the Mises Institute. Uh, could you say just a few words about that and maybe how the landscape has changed thanks to the influence of this organization? I should also mention that uh, I remember getting your letter. I, I phoned Murray Rothbard and I said, Murray, I've got this extraordinary letter from this student. And I want to send it to you and I think you should phone him. And Murray read your letter and he did phone you. Yeah, so that was. <laughs> so yeah, the, um, I, I had a good friend who, at this point, was the the uh, head of the of the Coke Foundation, and uh, of all the all that Coke was doing in those days, uh, academically, and uh, so, so I wrote him and told him I was going to start the institute, and I'd like his support, and they had a lot of money, of course. So he called me up and he said, he said, what the hell are you doing? I'm not gonna, the whole thing was a lot of bad, bad language. <laughs> what do you think you're doing? Do you realize how, how much money we've spent to get, trying to get rid of Mises? He said, we want to make Hayek the, the key guy. We want to entirely forget Mises. Don't you realize that everybody hate, hated Mises? That Milton Friedman hates Mises? He said, well, that's like a medal on, Milton, on Mises' chest, if that's true. <laughs> He said, he said, we're going we're gonna to oppose everything you're doing. We're not, 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 we're not going to support you. We're going to oppose you. I said, well, that's too bad, but OK. So, because that actually stimulated me to get even more, to, to really get going. The fact that this huge enterprise that uh, Murray Rothbard led it to dub the Coctopus um, was well, going to oppose us. But and all, all, all their organizations, Reason Magazine and, and uh, uh, Mercatus Center and so forth, all been in opposition to us, but it's okay. That's that's. Uh, I must say it's it's probably unusual that when, when a, a multi-billionaire hates your guts and wants to get rid of you, and you're still you're still able to succeed. It's pretty good. So it, it's. Uh, I, th I think actually the fact that they they did that was was stimulating. It actually made us more more dedicated to getting to succeeding. And that's true of Murray too, of course. And they they had uh, earlier done back. Murray had been one of the co-founders of the Cato Institute, and this was an unusual organization. It was a stockholders' organization, even though nonprofit. And they, the Murray, they said, "Let us keep your stock in our in our safe, so that you 
nothing can happen to it. So then later they they took it and tossed Murray off the off one of the co-founders off off the board and uh, stole his stock. So he talked to a lawyer and, and the lawyer said, "Well, you've got a, you've got a good case, but he said there's no way you can you can fight the Cokes." They can spend infinite amounts of money, hire infinite number of lawyers, and uh, so Murray had to give give that up. But uh, Murray eventually won, and of course, today I think Murray Rothbard is far better read than maybe maybe even the Milton Friedman. I mean, it's it's he's just a tremendous uh, people all, all over the world read him, and uh, it's translated to Chinese and many many different languages. And uh, so, Murray, you're, you're still a leader. Thank you. Um, let me turn to Pat for just a moment. Pat, you were one of the first, if not the first, employee of the Mises Institute. Maybe Marty was first, I'm not sure. But could you tell us a little bit uh, about what the Institute was like uh, in those early days? Did you ever imagine back then, in the early 80s, that we would eventually uh, grow to, to, to the level of size and influence that we are today? Well, it's, it's hard to describe to you nowadays what things were like back then. Uh, first of all, I want to recognize, I, I met Lou in 1982 when he was at the Law and Economics Center, and this was an idea that he was formulating. And we have with us today one of the first uh, board members who was still on the board, Debbie Ayers, uh, who, who worked with Lou to help found the Institute. But when I met Lou, the Mises Institute was literally his kitchen table. Um, he and Marty were moving around all over the place trying to get all of this started. His wife, Marty Rockwell, who is with us today, uh, an, an unsung hero. Um, so Lou met John Denson, who is also here today. Judge Denson has several speeches that are on Mises.org about the founding of the Institute and how he and Lou met and how he, he was on the board of trustees at Auburn and brought Lou to Auburn. But the, the very best one, I think, if you, if you look up John Denson in the Mises Library, Birth of the Institute, a speech he gave in Vienna in 2011 that is in great detail about the Institute coming to Auburn. So, um, so my first memories of the Institute coming to Auburn, Lou and Marty rolling up in a U-Haul with everything they owned, and they, they booked a room at the Heart of Auburn Motel, downtown. <laughs> now, the Heart of Auburn Motel, to say it was a dump is a, a luxury. It, that's, it, was, it was awful. But Lou knew that I had worked uh, on a database for another a nonprofit organization in the years past, and he said to me, I think we've got these donations coming in. I think we need to create a database. Could you come to Auburn uh, and work with a programmer at Auburn University to create a database to, to keep track of our donors and our students? And he said, it shouldn't take but a few weeks. So here I am 40 years later. <laughs> How's the database? Uh, we, were, we, we donated, we, the Institute, uh, Lou had an arrangement with Auburn University where we, we sponsored um, economic students. The first one was Mark Thornton, who was getting his PhD at Auburn, which meant they had to carry a lot of boxes. I mean, we were <laughs> this was, uh, as Peter said, pre-internet, no websites. Everything was done by paper. Um, we had the university uh, allowed us to have an office on campus. It was in a, in a thatch hall, a very old building, and so we were literally Marty and Lou and I in one office. We had probably the first computer with a hard drive on campus. Yes. Lou, by the way, very important for everyone to know, he started the institute with his own savings. This was his personal savings. He had no grants, he had no government money, didn't take a dime, hasn't since, and won't. Um, so this was a huge investment, and he, he had a child to support. This wasn't just a, something he did on a whim. Um, but we had, so we were crammed in this one room. Everything was done by paper. Uh, so you, it was, you know, you wrote everything. You wrote, you had a typewriter. I think we, I think we kept the typewriter in the archives here. It was the, <laughs> where all of the thank you letters were typed and, and everything. Uh, we were on the Auburn campus. So if, if you wanted to make a long distance call, you had to dial the Auburn University operator. 
and and then give them your department code for your, and they said, they would say, they knew us all by name, just from our voices. They would say, oh, Mr. Rockwell, I'll put you, I'll patch you out to an outside line. So that was some, when Lou called Murray Rothbard, it was, you had to go through the operator. It was, it was just a, everything was very, very different. Um, but the, the faculty in the economics department at that time were very friendly to us. We even sponsored the softball team for the Department of Economics. We were called the Mises Maulers. <laughs> and we, we played teams like uh, the biology department, who were the fungus among us. <laughs> and, and somewhere in the Mises archives is a picture of a very young Mark Thornton and I on the softball team. <laughs> So it was great fun. It was so exciting. It, you know, people, we would open a, a, an envelope and there would be a hundred dollar donation with a note. Way to go, Lou, get things started. And it was so exciting in those, those very early days. And it was all, by the way, a lot of the, um, the hard money people in those days donated their mailing lists, which were like gold, uh, to Lou to, to mail fundraising letters to, to get the Institute started. That's, simply because of his <coughs> reputation and they 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 wanted to see this movement get started and, uh, Pat as far as the conferences the summer conferences go if I'm not mistaken the first summer conference for students was held in 86 here at Auburn the first the next year yes. we had a small conference at Dartmouth and one at Stanford and we, then we, we began... skipped a year and then we started Stanford Dartmouth uh, and it it was just amazing that the students and I'm, I must say here, our students to us are family. We still get phone calls and emails from people from 1986 who say, let me tell you, I've made, I've got this publication or this career change, or these are pictures of my children and now pictures of my grandchildren. <laughs> so, uh, but my, the, those were, because Murray was such an integral part of this and he was so, he loved the students. He would stay up until late at night, and they'd go to Denny's and 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 have a patty melt. And he would talk, and you know, until two or three or four o'clock in the morning with these students. And then the poor students had to get up the next morning and be at class at eight o'clock. But, <laughs> but one of the one of the funny stories was uh, at Dartmouth. Back in those days, the faculty had to stay in the dorms with the students because that was all we could afford. And at Dartmouth, it was a very old dorm, and Hans Hoppe was on the faculty. And it turns out there was a bat in his dorm room. And it, he didn't discover, he, he kept hearing something, and he turned, made the mistake of turning the light on. So the bat just went crazy and started attacking him. But <laughs> you can just imagine how Hans Hoppe relays that story. <laughs> it was a Keynesian bat, no doubt. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I can remember a story from those days when uh, it was when the summer conference was here, but for some reason, I think the faculty were all going out to, um, uh, to have a meal, maybe at John Denson's house, and I, as a student, was the driver somehow, and so I'm driving this van in which is Murray Rothbard, Walter Block, David Gordon, Joe Salerno, Hans Hoppe, basically the modern Austrian movement is in the van. And I didn't really know how to drive this van very well. <laughs> these constant visions of, you know, plunging down a cliff and having the Austrian school end, you know, with me. Um, let me turn to David for just a moment. Let me, let me, let me, let me just mention one quick thing that, uh, about the softball, softball team that Pat mentioned. Uh, I always liked Roger Garrison's title, which was rejected, unfortunately. But he wanted to call it the Vienna Ordinals. <laughs> <laughs> so, David, you, you had met Murray Rothbard uh, in the late 60s or early 70s. And could, could you talk about um, how your relationship with Murray, how you met Murray, and how your relationship with Murray led to your involvement with the Mises Institute? Yes, well, I uh, had read Murray quite early on. I remember when Man, Economy, and State came out in 1962 uh, when I was in junior high, and I, I read that, but I didn't actually meet Murray till the late 70s. I knew a uh, libertarian in Los Angeles, George Smith, 
who is friends with Rothbard, and he invited me uh, to meet uh, Murray, uh, who was visiting. And uh, I remember we went to Cantor's restaurant in Fairfax, and I'm still going to that restaurant. And then after I met Murray, uh, I was invited to a conference at, held at uh, the Cato Institute in June 1979. I met, I, met Murray again and was talking to him. I met uh, two of his greatest friends, uh, Ronald Hamaway and Ralph Rako. Th they were, I would say, the two of them, uh, Ronald Hamaway and Ralph Rako, were two of the three most sarcastic people I, I've ever met. <laughs> so I, I got along with, with um, Murray very well, and afterwards I uh, Murray uh, got me a job at the Cato Institute, and then after Murray uh, was pressured out of the Institute, I went with him, and uh, it was uh, uh, Murray recommended me to uh, Lou Rockwell. And one thing I just mentioned when uh, Lou was talking, he mentioned that uh, when he was founding the Institute. There was an employee of the institute who was was very opposed to him. So one funny story about that: the man's name was George Pearson. He was nicknamed the Peanut. And when I met him many years later, he really did look like a peanut. <laughs> so uh, one of the I when uh, Pat was mentioning the. Uh, me, the first uh, conference at Stanford. I remember in one of those early conferences at Stanford, I was sitting next to Murray, and uh, someone came up afterwards and said, oh, you two seem to be having a good time. What was so funny? And what we couldn't tell the one who'd asked was, we were making up a list of which student should be kicked out of the conference. <laughs> So it was really, it was really a lot of fun in in those days. And I, I also remember going to bookstores with Murray and seeing him go through all the books, and he would know all of them. So uh, those were those were great days. Let me turn to Joe for a moment. Joe uh, was also an early uh, disciple of Murray Rothbard, and uh, Joe, you were involved in libertarian organizations uh, in New Jersey in the 1970s. You had met Murray. Um, you became affiliated with the Institute very early on, since the beginning. Um, could you talk about uh, what were your impressions of the Mises Institute in that day? What attracted you to Murray and to the Institute You know, when there were lots of other libertarian organs, organizations and groups you could have connected to? Well, it was experience with those other libertarian organizations and groups. So um, when I got my first job, um, I uh, had it was a small college in New Jersey, and then they then I was I was called up by people representing um, the Koch Foundation. They were starting an Austrian program, and I was told it was going to be very hardcore, and this was going to start up at, at Rutgers University. It subsequently moved to George Mason University. Um, so um, I was very excited about this. I accepted the job and. Um, so the two people, that, one of whom was a professor who I was going to be working with, and the other was sort of his, our mentor. Um, we, I had just read, uh, and it had just come out, Mises' Notes and Recollections. And Mises takes his gloves off in that and, and criticizes those people who deserve to be criticized and praises others who, who, who deserve to be praised. So, in our, our first meeting before the semester started for this Austrian program, um, I spoke to my, my colleague, um, was an Austrian, and, and, and the other Austrian was sort of a mentor and the liaison with, with the Koch Institute. And I said, isn't this a great book, Notes and Recollections? Mises really comes out swinging. Um, you know, he tells a lot of good stories and, and so on. And they just looked at each other and smiled. And they said, it's a disaster. The book is a disaster. Mises is uncompromising, he's intolerant, yeah, intolerant of error. 
Um, he, he comes across as a cranky old man. He says, uh, in our program, this Austrian program that I was going to be part of, um, of course we'll use Mises' works, but we're going to emphasize Hayek. We're, we're, we're going to downplay Rothbard. Um, we're going to be Rothbardians with manners. Um, in other words, you can't really criticize the, the mainstream. So Hayek was much, no, Hayek was a great economist, but he was, he was, he was much more acceptable to the mainstream. So that was one. Then I also was associated with the Institute for, for Humane Studies. I, I would give, um, in fact, I, with Murray and, and a few others, um, I, I, I would go in, uh, to conferences like these conferences in the, in the early 80s. Um, and uh, the, um, it used to be called Liberty and Society, which is a great name, straightforward. And then, then a year or two later, a year or two after they started, it suddenly became the spontaneous order. I mean, what student's going to be attracted to the spontaneous? They know what liberty is, and they know what society is. So the, this was sort of the background that I had. I, real, I, I didn't bother me at the time. I figured I could still teach Rothbard and Mises, you know, as, as long as we, we pretend that we're Hayekians and so on. Um, so when I was, I, I was first invited um, to a conference at the Mises Institute, uh, at, yeah, the Mises Institute in 1983, I think it was the Gold Conference. Um, I went down to Washington because it, it was located in a townhouse in Washington, and um, I w went went to, to, to the the quarter where they were quartered. Um, I think it was downstairs, or no, maybe it was the first floor. But anyway, I, I, I noticed that everybody, the staff was Marty and, and Pat, and even Lou were all sitting at the table, stuffing envelopes, doing work. Um, I, I, I spoke with them. This is the first time I had really, I met Lou once before, first time I really spoke with them. They were all dedicated, not, not, not just the, the, uh, Lou, but, but, but Pat and, and, and Marty, to, to, to the mission of, of, it was clear, disseminating Rothbard's and Mises' ideas to, to, to students and others and doing it in a way that was uncompromising. So I was, I was hooked right away, and then we had the conference, and I, um, the Gold Conference, and at the Gold Conference were, were all Austrian economists. Now, I had been involved also with Cato, and they had a conference on money maybe the next year or around the same time, and m most of the, the economists there were monetarists or even worse, and there were only a few <laughs> Austrian commentators. And they started off initially again, as sort of following the Austrian school, but the message was watered down. So I, I was thrilled to, to be associated with the Mises Institute. Um, I must say, when I, I came down for the first time to Auburn in 1991, um, and I had, been, I had been associated by then with the journal and with Murray, I mean, Murray I met in 1972, but um, uh, I thought they liked me but then they booked me in the heart of Auburn Hotel. <laughs> <laughs> Someone in particular on this panel. It was a test. Did, yeah, a, a test of my fortitude, yes. Um, but but the, the reason why I, I think the, the, well, let me, let me mention one other thing. Murray Rothbard was, again, downplayed in the libertarian movement late, in the late 70s when, when the Cokes started to um, fund a lot of different organizations and conferences um, and, and after the break with Murray Rothbard. Murray Rothbard really didn't have an intellectual home. Uh, that is uh, an organization where you have others that think like you, you can uh, talk, talk to them and bounce ideas off them, you can disseminate your own ideas. Um, he, he didn't have any way uh, of, uh, of promoting his vision of, of a free society and a free economy. And so the Mises Institute provided those resources. I mean, the, the, the old Austrian school would have never really gotten started um, unless they had had positions, which they did have at the University of Vienna. Um, but academia in, in, the, in the 1980s, American academia and 70s and 80s, were, was, were, it was closed to, to Austrians. So I, I, I think the founding of the Institute um, really kept the Austrian movement alive, or at least kept Murray Rothbard's ideas alive, and then we were able through the uh, conferences like the Mises University, started in 86, to begin to spread that to younger generations. And now we're two generations past me. Um, so that's, that's really why 
that, that's why I, I'm so committed to, to the um, Mises uh, Institute. I'd like to make a remark about uh, the Institute's strategy. You know, Murray Rothbard used to describe his approach to, to uh, you know, political activism in terms of a belief in what he described as universal rights, but locally enforced. So he believed in you know, timeless principle and truth, but the exact implementation of a specific policy reform was very dependent on local circumstances. I think the Mises Institute, in, in like manner, you know, has always emphasized and uh, promoted you know, universal truth. We're about uh, um, understanding and preserving and developing and extending and disseminating the ideas of the great thinkers from Karl Menger, you know, on to, uh, of course, Mises and Rothbard and more uh, recent writings. So we're not trendy and contemporary in glomming on to the latest fashion in, uh, you know, in intellectual circles or in, in higher ed. However, we've always been extremely flexible and adaptable in, you know, the means by which the message is developed. And some of you, if, if you're in my talk yesterday, I showed a picture of the first Mises.org. Uh, it was even something else before Mises.org. But um, I remember going to Lou probably in 1993 or 94. I had been exposed to the, the, uh, the internet and a web browser on something called NCSA Mosaic on a Unix machine, uh, probably around 93. And I, I, you know, and I could sort of, not that I'm some kind of super forecaster, but you, know, you could sort of see the potential as a means of disseminating ideas. And the only organizations that had a presence on the World Wide Web, as it was then called, were you know, the Smithsonian Institution and maybe a university or a museum here and there. And I remember showing this to Lou and saying, hey, what if we could take some articles from Mises Publications and, and put them on there? It, it's really easy. You can convert the text into this code called HTML, and I learned how to do it. And we could have like an article from you know the, the Mises newsletter and, and some links with information. And, and Lou was very receptive and enthusiastic, even though nobody really knew what this was. And I think, from my perspective, in the decades since, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, really embracing uh, the ability to use the internet to deliver content, you know, putting books, articles, lectures online, we have the live stream for all these kinds of events, uh, the use of social media. Uh, I think the Institute has always been at the forefront of trying to find the latest technologies and in some sense, you know, the way that ideas are packaged to appeal to contemporary circumstances, local circumstances of time and place, as Hayek would put it, without ever compromising the core message. And to me, that's a very nice, that's been an extremely effective strategy of the Institute and one that I certainly expect to continue. Um, we would like to uh, take some questions from the audience. Uh, oh, Connor's got a mic there. Yeah, so um, just raise your hand. And again, no speeches, but short uh, questions directed at one or more panelists would be appreciated. Hi, thank you. Thank you guys so much for sharing. Um, when you look at Murray Rothbard, right, you hear how he was really a happy warrior fighting in the battle of like spreading Austro-Libertarian tradition. And I was wondering, uh, well, a lot of us fellow students, like we can see the march of the state and we can get really pessimistic. What can we take from Murray Rothbard's life so that we can apply that and be happy warriors like he was when we're spreading these ideas? One thing he was a well a short term pessimist but a, a long term optimist I thought that uh, we, we, we would win in the long term and that uh, if we didn't then everything everything was gone so uh, he 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 believed we would win because we had to win and uh, I think we all feel that way to you today. I think also he, I think the lesson you would take from him is that he never gave up. He he was, he 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 was amazing. He just kept going, and and this is totally an aside. But I I don't think this panel can leave without mentioning Joey Rothbard, Murray's wife, who was, as he said, the indispensable framework. Just one last thing, Murray Rothbard also, um, to use Austrian terminology held liberty very high on his value scale. He said that. It, 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 
it was the right thing to do. It was right to have that high on your value scale. So as Pat said, he, he just never gave up. Uh, Joey was a, a, a brilliant, a, she was just a, 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 a unbelievably brilliant woman. And uh, Margaret von Mises always blamed Murray that she didn't get a PhD, but I, ne I, I never dared to say to Margaret, well, actually, he, she did exactly what you did for, for Mises. She did, did, dedicated her life to her husband. And uh, that was a good thing in, for Mises, and it's a good thing for, for Murray. But Joey was uh, absolutely an indispensable framework, and, and also somebody that, and an intellectual partner for him. She was uh, so smart, so funny, so interesting. And so, so we got a couple of her speeches online that uh, I would highly recommend you listening to, just so funny, so interesting. What a, what a great lady. Well, uh, one thing about uh, Joey also, she, she was a great expert on the Civil War period. She gave lectures on it uh, after Murray passed away. She, so she, 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 was, she could have been an outstanding historian. She, when she was also a great uh, authority on opera. Uh, Wagner. Yeah. Yes. All righty, so uh, this... Uh, might be primarily directed towards Dr. Salerno since he certainly seemed the most energized about the subject. Just to, uh, you've been implying this throughout the uh, panel here, but just to set the scene about how bad things were, uh, could you give us a description of the heart of Auburn Motel? <laughs> <laughs> I'll let Pat do that. <laughs> Let's just say it's been demolished and for good, <laughs> good cause. Yeah, it's where the, there's a CVS and a, what's that burger place? Burger, burger Fi down there on South College. That's where it used to be. Mercifully, it's bad. been replaced. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Other questions? Oh, can I stand up? Hi, thank you all for, for taking the time to speak to us. This is mostly directed towards Ms. Barnett and Mr. Rockwell, but towards the early days of the Institute, what was one of the biggest struggles you guys had to overcome, and was it unforeseen, or did you guys expect it? Uh, well, the, it, there were in the early days. It wasn't a struggle. I mean, we, it was so. It, I, I know I sound like I'm making this up, but it was so exciting and so much fun. Lou Rockwell was writing ten press releases a day, and we we would run them over to the Auburn University print shop and say, "We need five thousand of these in two hours," and then we would stuff them in envelopes and send them to every tiny radio station, television station, newspaper in the country every week. I mean, this was like, that was challenging, but um, there, were, there was a very lean financial time uh, that the Institute went through in the very early days, the first couple of years, and I think Lou, Lou got very discouraged. And a gentleman from Texas, a very humble gentleman, walked into the Institute in Auburn and handed Judy Thomason a check for a million dollars. And he said, I'm doing this because you save paper clips. And he had seen what the staff, how frugal we were and how Lou was working so hard. And that turned the tide for the Institute. Uh, Mr. Perry Alford, there's a biography of him on the Mises.org site. Great man, great man. Did, uh, just kind of a general question. Did any of you, uh, kind of in your early days as you were developing and uh, getting involved with the Institute, uh, did you have like a moment where you uh, sort of, uh, not necessarily with the Institute itself, but with the, uh, Austrianism and its ideas, uh, did you have a moment uh, where you can think back to and you, you can uh, realize that, oh, this was the moment when I sort of it changed uh, like change my life course or it changed how you fundamentally thought about the world and what was what was that moment? That happened to me before I started the Institute. So it, uh, the Institute was based on that from the very beginning and uh, I always thought that it was, that it was the only system, of, the only economic school that made any sense whatsoever. The rest of it just seemed to me to be a bunch of nonsense. And uh, I think that's continued to be the case, of course. Um, it happened to me when I was a, a, a junior in college. Um, I had taken in, uh, principles of micro, macro, um, intermediate macro, intermediate micro, and other courses. And someone, 
I had heard about the Austrian school, and I mentioned it to somebody who was a member with me in the Young Americans for Freedom, which was a conservative organization at the time. They gave me a little pamphlet called Depressions, Cause and Cure by Murray Rothbard. And so instead of going to my macro class, I sat in my car, because I was looking at it before class, and, and I just read it in 45 minutes, and by the end, I knew I was an Austrian. I, I realized that there was more sense and wisdom in that pamphlet than, than there was in, in any, uh, any, anything that I had been taught up to that point. Well, yes, I think I had this moment uh, when I read uh, Human Action and Man, Economy, and State back in the early days, and I said, oh, this, this makes sense. I, I really enjoyed the deductive approach. I thought this, this is really the right way to go, and I, I've never changed my view since then. Okay, well, we are out of time. Thanks to the panelists and thanks to all of you for coming. <laughs>